Good morning, good morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to look in your word, Lord. Uh, we praise you and we thank you so much that uh, we have these opportunities that uh, many generations didn't, and even people in the world today can't get a hold of a Bible. But I praise you and I thank you so much for providing it, providing a country like this that uh, can help uh, spread the word. Uh, and we continue to do that. We be, a, be the light and help us to do that, Lord. In our precious name, in Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> picking up from where we left off last night, uh, yesterday, was that we are talking about uh, John the Baptist. And it, uh, today we're going to finish off by John the Baptist actually baptizing Jesus. But before that, we've got to finish up uh, a few more verses. We left off at uh, verse 11 of chapter 3. And so we will pick up from there and continue on. And at the end of this one, we actually get to see Jesus baptized. And that's why I named it that. So let's get some verses up here and start taking a look. Uh, where'd it go? There it is. So I uh, kept the same picture. I got a new picture when we get to Jesus, uh, but uh, we'll keep the same picture until we get to uh, Jesus' baptism. So here we see that uh, 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 when we left off, John the Baptist was actually addressing some people in the audience who were asking him questions. And we had left off, he had talked to some Pharisees and uh, not, in not so kind words, he told them pretty much what he thought of them. And uh, we're up to, there's a few other people that are gonna ask him questions, starting in verse 12. The first ones are publicans. And publicans are uh, similar to what Matthew was, a, a tax collector, or somebody who worked collecting the taxes for the Romans. So we'll pick up there. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? So remember, they were asking questions about how to be, uh, how that they can be uh, achieve salvation and be uh, in the Lord's favor. Remember that uh, up to this point, Jesus is not, of course, not, hasn't been crucified and died and rose again. Uh, so that uh, you can't look to Jesus not, uh, yet uh, for salvation. Uh, but salvation up to John uh, and until Jesus actually uh, becomes our perfect sacrifice on the cross, uh, that basically by your righteousness, you are, you are saved. So that uh, you had to represent uh, being righteousness uh, with God. And John is uh, kind of explaining to people how you can achieve that. And so uh, what he's saying is that basically that, uh, uh, let me actually reread that portion. Uh, let me see where it is. Uh, let me see. It's talking about fruit. Uh, I was back in verse 7. I'll just run this through this real quick, uh, the review. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from wrath to come? Bring there forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. Some people used to believe that as long as they believed that they were of Abraham's seed, that they were saved. And that wasn't necessarily true. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid upon the root of the tree. Every tree that therefore which bringeth forth not, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? And so that's where, that's where we are now. And John is answering them. And he, at first he was talking to the publican, I mean, to the uh, Pharisees. And now he's up to the publicans. What shall we do? And his answer is,
Oh, and before I get to 312. Just a couple of verses talking about uh, uh, <clears throat> over in Luke 18, 13, talking about publicans. Oh, yeah, uh, a couple of verses about publicans and who they were. And a publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I want to point to some of these other people that have shown this is Jesus talking about a publican he saw. Uh, in comparison to a Pharisee. I want to point out that uh, here is true mercifulness, that he uh, knows he's a sinner and he's repenting of it. And also over in Matthew 21, 31 and 32, what of them twain did they not, uh, did the will of their father, they said unto him, the first Jesus said unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards, that he might believe. Uh, this is Jesus actually reminding them that they were believing John the Baptist. Uh, and uh, I mean that they didn't believe John. <coughs> Again, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here. About reflecting back on John, uh, that the, uh, the the sinners, the publicans, and the uh, and the harlots uh, believed him, and so that uh, but Jesus is basically saying that because they believed him, that they're in a better position than you are. Uh, the uh, Pharisees at that time frame uh, were kind of like uh, allowing their power to get to them. Uh, pride was really stepping in, and they were allowing their pride to uh, stand in the way of true righteousness. And that's what Jesus is driving at there. So back to Luke 3.13. And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed to you. And so this is John's answer. As it, uh, Don't take any more uh, than what's required uh, of each person for their taxes. So it, it was very common at that time frame that uh, uh, the publicans or tax collectors would, would take as much as they could uh, to line their own pockets because their their income was based on how much extra they got over what Rome required. Uh, so that uh, those were some pretty shady publicans that wanted to get rich so that they were charging way over prices. Here's a good example of it. Uh, Zacchaeus uh, was a uh, fellow that uh, Jesus uh, ran into. And his, it's over in Luke 19, 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, that half of my goods I give to the poor, that if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restored him fourfold. And Jesus went on to say in that particular parable, in mean, that particular story, and Jesus said unto him, the day of salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. Uh, so that uh, basically Jesus is saying that uh, uh, for that fact, for that righteousness sake, that uh, he had done what he should have done uh, as a publican. And that's what I'm pointing out here. Okay, on to Luke 3, 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Uh, so uh, basically there he's telling him that, uh, you know, honor honor your uh, bosses and do and do what you're required to do, but don't do any more. And, uh, uh, and don't make up lies about somebody just to... Uh, be able to uh, commit violence against them, like false accusation. And this verse here, a great example is over in Acts uh, 10, 4 through 7. And when he looked up, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, The prayers in thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he lodges with one Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou ought to do. This is the story of the centurion uh, who had called on the Lord uh, for salvation. And the Lord knew he wasn't exactly getting it right. So he actually sent, uh, told him in a dream to go get uh, Peter. 
to come up and help him with it. In, in Acts 10, 7, And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. Uh, and, and the story goes on through chapter 10 of Acts. Great story of a uh, Gentile soldier uh, who came to the Lord and still maintained his ability to uh, command his troops. Great example of how to be a proper, uh, you know, sometimes uh, people say, you know, it's right, right or wrong whether you should be in the military or not when it comes to being a Christian. And uh, God never said that you couldn't defend uh, your country uh, and, and being and work in the service. Uh, many times uh, uh, God uh, actually helped certain, uh, you go through the Old Testament, there's lots of cases where God shined on, uh, you know, Joseph, uh, Jacob, uh, I mean, Joshua, when he came into the promised land and uh, they had to take over cities and towns and uh, the God was with them. So uh, sometimes, you know, evil men do have to be uh, taken care of and that uh, God will use men to do that. So there's nothing wrong with serving in the military. I did. I did it for 26 years and uh, it was uh, uh, something that I would do again if I was a young man. And uh, I think it's an admirable thing to do. Okay, back to Luke 3.15. Now, as the people were in an expectation and all the men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. So they're starting to wonder, they're starting to question, could this be the Messiah? You know, that's what they're thinking. Verse 16. And John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, and who he's talking about here is Jesus, of course, the latches of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is in his hand and, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. Uh, that's just a, a little bit of a prophecy by John to say that uh, ultimately Jesus is going to uh, handpick uh, who's going to uh, be with him and who's against him who's against them is going to end up being thrown into the lake of fire at the end of all time. Uh, but that's the ultimate goal, as the God, and the God through Jesus Christ is going to uh, basically uh, sift for the wheat uh, and find all the bad uh, grains and eliminate them. And that, uh, that's to be the chaff. And that the wheat, uh, the good wheat will he'll keep and uh, it'll continue on into heaven. And that's the department I want to be in. Uh, that I believe I am in too. Okay, so keep the things about this, uh, about the uh, chaff and the wind. Over in Jeremiah 15, 17. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Also in Matthew 3, 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Uh, same exact line over in Matthew, kind of confirms that uh, Jesus did say this. Back to Luke 3.18. Many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. Now we're gonna come into a different phase. Talking about, uh, this is a future date uh, after this period. Uh, I'm not sure why Luke put it in here because it, uh, this is kind of, future telling in a way. Uh, let me just read it and I'll try to explain it. But Herod the Tectorach, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's what Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done. What happened was is that uh, John had made an, made an accusation about uh, the goings on of Herod and his family. And uh, let me try to explain it uh, a little bit. Herod of Tippus, uh, uh, the original Herod that was over uh, in charge of uh, Jerusalem area when the Romans were in charge, was Herod the Great. Uh, and he had sons, uh, I think he had five sons total, but three of them ended up being in power. And, one, and Herod of Tippus, one of his sons, uh, and also his brother Philip, ruled in the northern part of the Providence, uh, up near the Galilee area, this is where John is basically. He had another brother who lived in Rome. Okay, so now Herod the Great had many wives and many children. And one of his sons had a daughter named Herodias. 
Now, Herod, who lived in Rome, married his half-niece, Herodias. But when Herod Atypus, the character we are dealing with here in our text, went to Rome, he seduced her into marrying him, leaving his brother marrying him and returning with him to reign in Galilee, which she did. So Herodias left her husband, who was also her step-uncle, and she was actually a stepsister-in-law to Herod Atypus and also his step-niece, but she became his wife. So it was, it was quite, an, uh, it was quite the, uh, uh, basically, incest situation. So your wife is also your niece and your sister-in-law. So John, and John actually spoke against this to Herod. Uh, and I just, uh, he didn't speak up against the, uh, and that's something you just didn't do that, is you didn't speak against the rulers. Uh, but John, being the type that he was, spoke out against that relationship and, uh, uh, basically saying to Herodias, you have no right, uh, you have no right having Herodias as your wife. That's wrong. What you did was wrong. And so as a result, Herod, Herod imprisoned John. And that's what these few verses is going to talk about. But the story of John isn't over. Uh, uh, not yet. So that, uh, to hear they're just commenting about Herod, and they're going to comment of who he is by mentioning his uh, Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. And for all the evils which the Herods had done, one of the reasons that Rome picked the Herods in the first place was the uh, they were considered Jews, uh, and they thought, but they were they were uh, they were actually out of uh, they're not they weren't true Jews by definition because they came not out of the line out of Jacob, but they came out of the line of uh, Esau, uh, and so they became. Uh, so Rome thought they were just regular Jews, and that's why they chose them to lead, because they seemed to favor Rome. But most of the Jews hated them, and so uh, for many good reasons. And if you want a good book to read, uh, read Obadiah, and you'll see how God feels about this particular uh, segment of uh, the uh, uh, dynasty leading down through Abraham. They're basically the Arab nations that you read about uh, today. Uh, and probably the most famous one you probably hear about is the West Bank and uh, Gaza uh, with those uh, those terrorist groups you see out of there. They're direct descendants of Esau. And so those are what God is uh, talking about in Obadiah, I believe. Uh, haven't got solid proof of it, but uh, it all started here either. And so John, uh, John actually called the Herods out for that. And just a few other verses on that particular subject over in Matthew 11, 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. And Matthew 14, 3. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. And so this is some other places it's mentioned. Uh, also... Verse 4, for John said unto him, it's not lawful for thee to have her. So these are the areas that are recorded in the scriptures. Also in Mark 16, 6, 17, and 18. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. That's Mark which is the, uh, the writer for Peter. So just a few other, so moving on to verse 20. And added and, and added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. I realize that he's, he put this in here and here between verses 19 and 20, but now we're gonna switch back to the baptism of John, of uh, Jesus. And so I'm not sure why Luke put it in there, except that maybe he was trying to, in retrospect, uh, talk about uh, Herod and how Herod fit into this whole scheme. So moving into uh, and some verses about uh, Herodias, uh, the queen. Uh, and uh, what, what ends up happening is when John's in prison is that there's a sneaky plot by... Uh, uh, Herodias, uh, the queen, uh, queen of uh, Queen Herodias, did to uh, take care of the situation because John basically had called her out, 
We see that recorded in Matthew 14, 3 through 10. And this is where John gets be, uh, beheaded, but this is uh, after Jesus, obviously, after his... Uh, so I'm kind of getting a little ahead of the game, but I thought it was a good place to stick it in here. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It's not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Her Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Talk about more incest. Now we got the daughter, and I'm sure that this dance was one of those kind that uh, typically uh, men enjoy, but uh, women don't usually enjoy very much. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatever she should would ask. So uh, Herod's really pleased with the dance. So he says to her, I give you anything you want. He's probably drunk too. And she said, being before instructed of her mother, Herodias said, give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. Uh, so this is what started the whole thing of John being beheaded. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And so because he had just promised her that uh, up to half his kingdom, uh, he had to follow through with the order. But he wasn't happy about it. Uh, he didn't really want to kill him. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. Uh, and I won't uh, continue the rest. Basically, they bring it back on uh, a platter uh, for the uh, queens, uh, for the for the queen uh, to, to have kind of a, a very sad ending to John the Baptist. But we're not done with John yet because, uh, like I said, I don't know why Luke put it in there. So back to uh, Luke 3.21. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus' baptism. And now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open. Now let me change my picture. Nope, oh, not that picture. This picture. So happier times. Okay, so a little uh, artist rendition of uh, uh, Jesus being baptized. And talking about baptism, uh, just I mentioned the other places that mentions that uh, Jesus was baptized. That's over in Matthew 3.13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Uh, over in Mark 1.9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. And straightway came up out of the water and he saw the heavens open and a spirit like a dove uh, descending upon him. If you look real close, there's a dove up above Jesus there. Uh, you kind of see like this hazy smoke coming down on Jesus. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You can imagine whoever was there that day was definitely a believer. Uh, actually heard from God the Father uh, to confirm who that was as being baptized. And a few other places I thought I'd show the same thing. It's recorded in all four Gospels. So I thought I'd just do that uh, to finish up today. The next day, John seeing Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Uh, this is a great verse. It tells us exactly what Jesus came to do. He's going to be our sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. And John said it out loud uh, to a multitude right here. Uh, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. So anyone who tries to say that, uh, they, that it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible that that's why Jesus came, there it is. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bear record is saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he had he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon him whom thou sh shalt see, the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized 
with the Holy Ghost. So it's basically saying there is that John was a witness and all the all the folks around him. Uh, but John was also told that the person he sees that he baptizes and the spirit comes upon him uh, verifies to John and to us that that is the Messiah. Messiah. And I saw and be a record that this is the son of God. You'll notice I use the King James Version that, that, that the whenever it's talking about Jesus uh, as a term of son of God, the the capital in S is, I mean, the S in son is always capitalized. Uh, so you can always tell when they're talking about because there are places where son of God is is actually in reference to us because we're adopted into the family of God as sons of God. Uh, but it'll be a little less. And that kind of tells you that we're not deity. Only Jesus is deity. Just a little note on that. Back to Luke uh, 3.22. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, and thee I am well pleased. And over in Matthew 17.5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud. Oh, I want to show you the other places that God spoke uh, audibly so the people around them could hear him. Uh, and a couple other places I wanted to point to. And one is in Matthew. This is when uh, Jesus took uh, uh, James, John, and Andrew and Peter up on the hill. And they saw Jesus uh, in his uh, uh, divine state. And while he had spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Also in Luke 9, 28 to 35. And it came to pass after an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, Elias. This is the verse that many people believe that the two witnesses we're going to see, or we're not going to see, but they are going to be seen in Jerusalem during the tribulation, are going to be Moses and Elias, Elijah, Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decrease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass that they departed from him. Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Good old Peter taking a nap, and he missed the whole point uh, as it died. Uh, Jesus is God, and he was given instructions to Moses and Elijah, uh, who are subordinate to him. But here, Peter is trying to make them all equal. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Uh, we'll see these verses again when we get to chapter 9. But uh, just to give you an idea of some of the other places that God the father actually appeared and uh, spoke on behalf of his son to verify who he was. Remember my philosophy. Um, uh, you should be able to find any really strong doctrine two or three places in the uh, Bible. Uh, there's a verse on that. I should I should have it someplace to quote it all the time. that talks about that. Uh, I'll try to find it for next time. And last verse, uh, 2 Peter 1.17. And Peter here is in his... Uh, when he was writing a letter later in life, uh, he commented about this, just to verify. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When they came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So Peter had talked about this later on when he wrote a letter. Uh, this was well after Jesus was gone up to heaven and probably more like 50 AD time frame. So in there for today, and uh, we will continue on tomorrow. And tomorrow is going to be interesting because I'm going to talk about genealogy. And usually genealogy sounds kind of boring. 
Um, I'm going to try to spike it up a little bit. Uh, the rest of the chapter of Luke here is about uh, Mary's genealogy. Uh, and I'm going to show you why it's Mary's in comparison to Joseph's. Because it makes a comment about Joseph. We know Joseph isn't the biological father of Jesus. And Luke knows that too. And we're going to see the differences between Luke's uh, definition of the uh, genealogy and Matthew's. Uh, I'll just point out, I'm not going to read through, I'll probably read through the Luke one, uh, but I'll point out the differences to the Matthew one, which uh, the Matthew one is Joseph's genealogy, uh, where, where Joseph is signified as being Jesus' father for the purposes of showing the line from David. Whereas the, uh, uh, this one here in Luke is the biological line, uh, which actually runs through Mary. And there's a good reason why it is, is because there was actually a blood curse put on one of the descendants of, jo of uh, David uh, that went through Joseph's line or through Solomon's line. Uh, this line actually goes through Nathan, and this line here ends up being uh, Mary's line. So it's pretty interesting that Jesus was born of Mary and still keeps to the promises of being in the line of David. Uh, so fascinating in that respect. So I'll try to show that to you tomorrow. And we will end with a prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much for this time. I get to look so deeply into your book uh, and your word and uh, get more understanding. And thank you, Lord, so much for these studies and helping me, Lord, to uh, really dig in and, and find all those uh, little things that are really interesting about uh, all these different uh, things you're trying to teach us. And we give you the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, and you guys all have a great day, and we will talk again tomorrow.